This career, which you're um, so generously honoring tonight, um, had some ludicrous beginnings, like the first big story I got to report. Uh, for nine months in 1951-52, I was the all-night disc jockey on a 5,000-watt radio station in Halifax called CJCH. All the journalism required of me was every hour to rip and read the five-minute British United Press uh, radio summary. One morning in January 1952, I passed the teletype machine on the way to the men's room, and it was shaking and ringing bells, behavior that was new to me uh, at the time. Uh, I went to the men's room. <laughs> first, first things first. And then, then I looked at the printer and saw bulletin, King George VI died today. I thought about that. And maybe I should get that information on the air. After all, he was our king. He was much loved in our family during World War II. He decorated my father, a convoy escort skipper with an OBE at Buckingham Palace. People would want to know. But it was only 10 minutes to 7, and the news time was at 7. And that quarter hour was filled with a syndicated talk by a Dr. Michelson in Los Angeles. I could hear him on all the station speakers decrying the neglect and desecration, desecration of some graves in Israel. It seemed to me either sacrilegious, or worse, commercially unsound, to interrupt his sermon. I wavered, but finally I tore off the copy, went back to the control room, turned down Dr. Michelson, opened the microphone and said, CJCH regrets to announce that King George VI died today, then turned Dr. Michelson back up again. <laughs> In a few minutes, the teleprinter uh, down the hall chattered out another bulletin. The king died peacefully in his sleep, according to an announcement from Buckingham Palace, and I delivered that the same way. Then the phone rang, and the station manager, Finley MacDonald, a future Canadian senator, shouted at me from St. John's, New Brunswick, St. John, New Brunswick, where he was attending a, a conference. What the bloody hell did I think I was doing? Didn't I know there were formal procedures for such moments? Stop all programming, play serious music, join the CBC, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, I didn't know. <laughs> Later, I became a CBC announcer, as Lloyd mentioned, uh, in Ottawa while I was studying at Carleton. When the first TV station opened, I became the first English language announcer. It was a bilingual station. Sometimes the French announcer didn't show up, and I got to regale the francophone population <laughs> of Ottawa Hall by signing off, et maintenant, avec l'audition de God Save the Queen, nous vous disons bonsoir. <laughs> the station soon acquired a mobile unit, or what we then called an outside broadcast unit, and they were eager to try it out at the opening of that year's Ottawa Valley Exhibition. It was broadcast live, not kinescoped or bicycled around the country as many programs were at the time. This was live. So I stood with a lollipop mic and said something like, today the CBC brings you the first television coverage of the historic Ottawa Valley Exhibition. Before we see the delights of this year's X, I'm pleased to have the man who for the past 27 years has directed this important cultural event in Canada's capital, Mr. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. <laughs> he told me, and I began interviewing him, and then remembered with panic that I also had to turn and interview the number two guy. I kept stretching the first interview while desperately under trying to recall his name. <laughs> Finally, the floor manager signaled to move on. I thanked the first man and said to camera, we're also fortunate to have the assistant director, Mr. You're not going to believe this, but I've forgotten your name too. <laughs> He believed me. <laughs> Next, we took the mobile unit out to Uplands Airport for the arrival of the Duke of Edinburgh. The entire cabinet of Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent was lined up at the foot of the steps to shake the royal hand. I had no interest in politics, and I couldn't have recognized any of them except maybe Saint Laurent. So we made a clever plan to identify each minister as he was presented. The producer, Pierre Normandin, some of you may remember, poked his head out of the roof of the van like a tank commander while I was down in the bows looking at a monitor. 
As each minister was presented, Norman Dunn reached down and handed me a file card, which I took and read the name. It was perfectly timed. We got everyone wrong. <laughs> Experience like that is what makes Canadian broadcasters so sought after in the United States. My journalism was informed by my Canadian background, and not just my talent for forgetting names, although that persists. It is not easy to express unpretentiously, unpretentiously, but I think it amounted to a kind of Canadian sensibility, or a sensibility shaped largely here in Canada. These are some pieces of it. A dislike of overstatement, of gilding the lily, of tearing the passion to tatters, of splitting the ears of the groundlings, practices that have now find a noisy home on some cable news. In his recent novel, Freedom, Jonathan Franzen character dislikes what he calls the Blair on CNN. I dislike the Blair. I dislike being shouted at by reporters, even when they're standing in a quiet studio, as though the microphones they're wearing couldn't carry their voices if they just spoke. They make news reporters sound like hockey commentators. I dislike programs that encourage guests all to talk at once because they think the shouting match makes better television. Those peeves have shaped my own work. I recognize in myself a natural skepticism, an aversion to being snowed, a suspicion that when the crowd is all going one way, the other way may be more interesting. I have an aversion to extravagant displays of patriotism, excessive flag waving. I share that strange Canadian resistance to facile hero making and hero worship. Another ingredient in that ironic distance Canadians employ when they feel their big neighbor is taking up too much psychic space. In a memoir entitled Looking for My Country, Finding Myself in America, a decade ago, I tried to describe the long and rather tortured psychological journey that made me the Anglo-Canadian American or the Anglo-American Canadian that I am today. In my case, and I think case is the appropriate word. Much of what I'm calling a sensibility was born in the ambivalence, or perhaps ambivalencies, I absorbed in childhood before and during the war, heavily Anglophile at the time in Nova Scotia, and the complex of feelings generated by having two American grandparents and two Canadian. If I sound sour about the United States, I am not. I have every reason to be grateful for the opportunities it's given me and for the life and friendships I enjoy there. But I find myself agreeing with John Lukács, a Hungarian historian who emigrated to the United States after World War II. He wrote, it is easier to become an American than to become American. It's true. And that truth has colored my journalism, kept me something of an outsider, especially on issues like the justification for the Iraq war, on our, or other issues that help define a Canadian identity, like opposition to the death penalty, support for national health care and gun control, and the value of public broadcasting. Or most recently, the value of a reg... Or, most recently, the value of a regulated banking system that did not share the casino mentality behind the recession of 2008. I didn't advertise my personal opinions on such issues in my work. I took care not to, but they often informed the stories I chose and the questions I asked. To, to that extent, that sometimes made me a pain in the ass to my colleagues, they could blame Canada. But I thank the Canadian spirit that shaped me when I was young and not really aware that it was happening. Today, looking for my country, I find it inside me in values formed long ago. So I'm grateful to the Canadian Journalism Foundation for causing me to think about this stuff again, afresh, and for the great honor you do me tonight. Et maintenant, avec l'audition de God Save the Queen, nous vous disons bonsoir. <laughs> 